let's start with the big kahuna, which is NAD. NAD is a chemical in the body. We have a lot of it. We have grams of it in our body. And it's used for chemical reactions. And without it, we're dead in 30 seconds or less. It's like taking cyanide, you're dead. So NAD is essential for life. Okay, but what, what does that mean? And that's what people are always asking. What does that mean? Is it the okay. battery? Is it, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Hey, okay, how are you good. doing? So good, how are you? Been great. Okay, it's good. Sweet. So Gizmo's here. He's asleep though, but he's still with us in spirit. And he knows what all the questions are. And we've already given a bit of a, a brief intro because I think most people on here already know who you are and they're super excited because they already had a chance to listen to you, your podcast interview. Um, but someone says the dog in the background. I guess some people haven't met Gizmo yet. So, um, so, so there's Gizmo. Anyway, you know he was coughing, so we had to give him some medicine. He's the star of the show. He really is. You know, he knows more about aging than anyone else. Really, these questions should be directed to Gizmo. <laughs> so, okay, so here we are. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited. We have almost 2,000 people on who were already on before you got on and waiting because they have all these questions. Um, I don't know how many of you have already had a chance to listen to Dr. Sinclair's podcast, listen or watch, and if you have, well, there's so many hearts. I would say drop it in the comments if you have and, uh, and let us know what you thought of it. And I know that there's a bunch of questions, but um, I'm gonna just let you kind of dive in because I know that you've seen a lot of the questions <laughs> we have so yeah. many he's pretending there, to be a palm rub yes there are some very nice comments thank you everyone that's uh, very kind um yeah so it's great to be back really great mm -hmm. i thought our first one was was a good intro to what we were both on about but today we want to dig a little deeper dive a little deeper into a number of questions uh we had a number of questions that came up actually uh from people um over the the last few days actually a lot yeah. of people texted it in um, you know, the, the, the kind of things we want to cover today are, are I've got the list here in front of me. Yeah. Uh, we want to get make sure we tell people how we can make changes now that will affect their longevity. It's not just for old age. In fact, if you start now, you've got a much better chance of having a healthy future. So let's talk about that. Yes. Uh, why is 80% of your lifespan in your own hands? I'll tell you why and what we can do. Mm -hmm. And because I'm talking to you, Serena, we're going to talk about food a lot because uh, that's your area, one of your area of expertise. Uh, also, uh, what about food fads? We'll get into that. Um, mm -hmm. What's true, what isn't, is what I do based on science or not? I think you know the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we want to talk about how to make this a lasting change, because if you change everything at once, uh, it, it's not going to work. So we're going to give you advice on how to go about living the best life you can. Yeah, and I and I love that because that's something as as you know I've shared with you the community, having it be a sustainable change is really is really what matters. Something that really incorporates into your lifestyle. We kind of do it with ease, so it doesn't cause the kind of stress that we don't want. There's all kinds of stress that we do want, which you've shared, and people here want to hear more about that. But uh, we want to make these changes something that's doable. It's easy. It's easy. It feels good. Um, you meet your goals in a timely way. So it is really sustainable. Uh, so let's dive in. Let's dive in. We we want to we want to address at least the questions um, and the points that we've offered that we've already shared on the caption that people are looking forward to, which are which purely genetic factors play into aging. And and I know that most people have listened to this podcast already, but let's do sort of a recap for those people who haven't. And there are so many questions and comments coming in here. I'm Thank you so much. You're an amazing audience, but we probably won't get to all of these. Um, but so grateful. And I'll scroll through while David is talking to see which ones and, we can capture. And we can also answer questions after this. Um, yeah. This live. Yeah, we'll do that. So the, the basic fundamentals of aging um, longevity research that we've discovered is that there are genes that control aging. In simple organisms, I started studying yeast cells that you've all used to make bread and probably some beer. Uh, we discovered a set of genes called sirtuins. Those are one category of gene that seems to be important for protecting us. But there are a whole bunch of them. There's at least 
50 major genes that control our longevity. And I'll, I'll just, I'll touch on three main ones. So I mentioned sirtuins, there are seven genes yep. in those and they protect us. They protect our, our skin uh, in the cell, they protect our, uh, our proteins and our DNA and our membranes, the lipids. Um, so we'll get to those. That's because that's what I study. I can talk a lot about those. Then there's another category called mTOR, little m, capital T-O-R. If you haven't heard of that, this is the, the proteins in your body that sense how many amino acids you're getting. And if you're not getting enough, uh, a ton of protein, let's say you're on a plant-based diet, mTOR will start to turn on the body's defenses against aging and start to recycle proteins to make more amino acids. And that's proven to be very healthy. And then the third category of gene that controls our longevity, we believe, is called AMPK. Mm. Stands for AMP activated kinase. And that's just an enzyme that regula is regulated by energy. So if you eat a huge amount of carbohydrates, and you have a huge amount of sugar in your blood, then AMPK will actually be start to shut down and you won't be as healthy. So we're going to uh, hopefully get to later about how to make sure your blood sugar levels don't go super high so you keep those genes super active to defend us against aging in the long run yeah i think we have so many things to cover i was kind of taking a look at our notes and taking a look at all the questions that i think our goal for this first live series might end up being broken into three um just in case our teams are on here you guys this might end up being a three part of a one part um <laughs> But we want to be able to answer all the questions. And I think some of the, a lot of the questions that came through um, on my platform was just really kind of understanding mTOR and what that means in terms of how much protein they're taking into their diet. And I know that we're going to address food sort of categorically separately, but I think that that might be a great place to weave it in so that people understand that. Yeah. So you can explain. Okay, so M mTOR is in every cell. And it is in our cells to sense when there's a, an abundance. Cell bodies can be in, in really two states. It can mm -hmm. sense abundance or adversity. Okay. And for long-term health, you want to mimic adversity or even give your body a bit of adversity. And one way to do that is now, to... Now, why? If you don't mind me asking why, because I, I know it sounds so basic, but I get that question a lot. Why do we want to stress our bodies out. Why do we want to stress ourselves out? Yeah, well, stress doesn't mean psychological stress, obviously. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. But biological stress, making the body think that it might run out of food next week, or mm -hmm. it's being chased by a mammoth or something like that, that turns on these defenses that have been in life forms for billions of years, even yeast cells. And the reason we have them is that it helps us survive. It helped our ancestors survive when times were tough. And if we sit around all day uh, and we eat a lot of food and we don't exercise and we don't feel any temperature change, then our body doesn't waste energy. It becomes complacent and it doesn't put energy into survival. It puts it into other things like growing and reproducing. But you can find this optimum we've discovered, certainly in animals, and, and it looks very true in our bodies as well, is that if you just give a little bit of what we call mimicked adversity or hormesis, Hormesis is the true term for it, that the body gives you the benefits without you actually have, having to suffer too much. And your body gets all the nutrients it needs to grow and reproduce, but also turns on these survival factors. Mm -hmm. So, and so for all of you that asked me why it was important to stress our bodies out, that's um, the perfect explanation for that. So thank you. And uh, we actually had several comments about the sound um is is there is the sound on your end turn up all the way i think on my end it's turned up all the way but um let's see okay okay how's that that's yeah. better is that okay. better for yeah. you guys it's better for me is that better for you guys that okay good we're getting emojis saying that the sound is good <laughs> it's better okay great so okay, so then, so then, if you could then dive into um, tor and proteins and um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I'll go on about that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be a little bit professorial. I'll profess. We love it. We love it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other week, I, I had some people come to my lab and they said, "Oh, we forgot you're actually a professor." So him, let me try. So uh, mTOR is a is a, a system in the body that senses how essentially how much protein you're getting if you eat a lot of meat it'll be uh, 
uh, regulated in a way that's not as conducive to as when you have a limited amount of protein. So why do you want to know when there's a limited amount of protein? Well, you need to get ready for, for potential adversity. And one way of doing that is turning up autophagy or autophagy, some people call it. And that's the recycling of proteins. Now, I think we, we're all aware that proteins can get damaged. They can get oxidized. They can even get coated in sugar. Uh, it's one of the hallmarks of diabetes is your proteins in your body gets get caramelized. And what the, the body wants to do is to sense when there's a low amount of amino acids, particularly three types, three, three amino acids. There's leucine, isoleucine, and valine, called branched chain amino acids. And it's been found that animals and humans that have lower, not, not deficient, but lower amounts of those branched amino acids have an mTOR activity that's beneficial. And then mTOR, what it does in response to sensing a limitation of these amino acids is it starts to increase the recycling of old damaged proteins, which we think drive aging. Mm. And that's really key. And so that's one of the reasons that I skip meals. And also I'm, I've am i switched largely to a plant-based diet because I want that autophagy process to be stimulated as much as possible to protect me against aging. And, and particularly diseases like Alzheimer's disease, which are caused in large part by these old misfolded proteins. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you. That was um, an amazing explanation. That was really digestible. I think, especially for my community. Uh, since you brought that up, and there has been, I mean, I would say a good fifteen to twenty percent of the questions that come in, or the comments that come in, um, have been about this recent switch that you've had to a, a more plant-focused, plant-based diet, and some of the information that you shared in your first podcast about that. So, um, if you wouldn't mind kind of diving into that just in a little bit more detail so that the people who uh, mm -hmm. want to make that transition uh, and even the people who maybe don't want to to remove meat from their diet, remove animal protein from the diet, but they want to reduce it and they sort of have a better understanding of why that is um, from a scientific perspective yeah. and from an aging perspective. Right. Well, first of all, I have to give credit to you because since we we're on together on the Instagram live. Uh, you've turned me on to a plant-based diet. So thanks for that inspiration. Uh, and you've been educating me over the last mm -hmm. few months. So thank you for that. It's made a big difference in my life and in my blood biochemistry and my actual biological age. Uh, and so what I've done is um, done more reading and listened to you and followed you on, on uh, social media. And I've come to the, the conclusion that based on a lot of evidence on thousands of papers that a plant-based diet is in the long run really really the best one to be on now in the short term what what you can do if you want to eat a lot of meat and i like meat so you know i i, I wish meat was was super healthy it just turns out it isn't but in the short run you're putting your body in this state of um, abundance right remember you got abundance versus adversity and a lot of meat and fat will give you this abundance so you, you'll feel good short, short term and you'll probably grow muscle better, but mm -hmm. long term it's not because you want to be in this adversity mimic state. Mm -hmm. um, but so practically speaking, I've been looking at a number of foods that protect against cancer as really strong results there from plant yeah. diets. If you take the blood of people who have been on a plant based diet and put it on cancer cells, it can 4,000% more kill those cancer cells than someone who eats a, a meat-based diet. So those are really compelling. And those that are on uh, vegan, vegetarian, and pescatarian diets, in general, live longer and are protected from about 15 different major diseases. So I'm, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the science is there. It's, uh, it's not really an argument uh, at this point. Uh, so what I've been doing personally is I've been eating a lot more uh, nuts, uh, vegetables. My fridge is now full of plant-based foods. And the, 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 the shock to me was how easy it was. Uh, I basically in one day said, okay, I'm not eating meat anymore. And I haven't for the most part, I mean, maybe a couple of times socially. Uh, and that's important to note, you know, I'm, I'm not as hundred percent strict. Occasionally I'll break it for, for reasons, you know, that, that I'm human and I don't mind, it's not going to hurt me. But overall, most of my food now is vegetable uh, and plant-based. And I've also cut out dairy because it turns out that the benefits against cancer of a plant-based diet 
can be somewhat negated by including dairy in that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that you taught me that and uh, the science backs it up. Um, well, that's, um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, uh, I, I appreciate that. I'm just really happy to see that um, you've made some shifts and there's a lot of science behind it. Um, I know that we've kind of, we kind of bounced back and forth food and um, the genetic factors and m we're kind of going back and forth a little bit, but I appreciate you addressing that just because so many questions and comments have come in um, from that. And, you know, when you're talking about plants and cancer, I know that you, we, you know, recently just chatted a little bit more about that. And there's so, there's so many people in, I think, both their audiences whose lives have been affected by someone that they love, um, someone that they know, or just personally with cancer, it would be great if you could share some of those um, benefits from plants. Um, I know that when we talked, we talked about um, Christopher's uh, vegetables and sulforaphane, but I would love if you could share a little bit more of the research that you recently shared with me about that. Yeah, so what we've discovered actually is that the, the plants make their own survival molecules to turn on their own survival genes. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have mTOR and AMPK and so too, and it's the same in our bodies. And those same chemicals we've discovered, when you eat them, can activate our own survival longevity pathways. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we, we have a terrible name that, that I take full responsibility for called Xeno from Meatman's. Xeno means. I like that. Yeah. It, I do. Okay, thanks. Uh, you might be the only one. But so <laughs> Xeno means uh, from other species. And hormesis, I explained earlier, uh, if you're on hormesis means whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And so we can get these benefits from plants. And it's my belief, and there's a lot of evidence now, that the benefits you get from plants by eating broccoli, cru uh, cruciferous vegetables, tomatoes, green tea, these are primarily through xenohormesis mechanisms, turning on our body's natural defenses, and not so much antioxidant activity. And one of the main reasons is, well, there's two main reasons. One is that antioxidants don't really have a big effect on lifespan and longevity and health in general. Um, and that these plant molecules like ECGC from, uh, from matcha tea and green tea and resveratrol from red wine, just it seems coincidental, but it's not coincidental. They hit just the right pathways or the genes in the body to promote longevity and long-term health. And that re requires an explanation. It's not just simply antioxidants. Right. Um, and I'm glad you pointed that out. I did share a post just recently about antioxidants and how much they uh, factor into anti-aging. So it's really great for you to sort of re-educate people about that because up till this point, and myself included, you know, that's something that I had been saying, um, that they had a huge impact when really, you know, maybe they don't. But that being said, antioxidants still do protect your cells from uh, free, damaging free radicals, and it's still very Thank healthy you. for you. Um, but to know that there's a there's a slight discernment about whether or not they're anti-aging, um, or they're just, they're healthy and they protect your cells. So, um, so thank you for pointing that out. Uh, we have so many questions about NMN and NAD and resveratrol and things that you talked about with Andrew Huberman recently on your live with him um, and in your podcast with him. So we're sort of at the halfway point and I don't want to get hit with, you know, a bunch of comments after this that says we didn't address some of the questions. You know, where would you, we have, we still have so many points that we had shared that we would cover. Um, where would you like to go? Do, should we bounce over to some questions um, and then kind of go back to our topics or what would you like to do here? Well, let's do NMN because, or NMN. Okay. Because people get up, upset if we don't address it. Yeah. It's, it's on everybody's mind. But first of all, well, can you can you do can you explain the difference between NR, NAD, and NMN? Because that's a question gets that pops up constantly and it's confusing. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with the big kahuna, which is NAD. NAD is a chemical in the body. We have a lot of it. We have grams of it in our body, and it's used for chemical reactions. And without it, we're dead in 30 seconds or less. It's like taking cyanide, you're dead. So NAD is essential for life. Okay, but what, what does that mean? And that's what people are always asking, what does that mean? Is it the okay. battery? Is it, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. The, okay. uh, so NAD moves hydrogen atoms from one chemical to another in the body. 
actually called a hydrogen donor. It's like a carrier. And hydrogens are important. They're just with carbons and hydrogens, we can make a lot of molecules. And so what NAD is, is used, so en an enzyme is a protein that makes other chemicals. And so it might say, hey, I need a hydrogen for my favorite molecule that I'm going to build. It's like building blocks. And along comes NAD, but it'll carry an H, a hydrogen, and it's called NADH. So NADH comes along, it'll attach the enzyme. The enzyme will say, thank you very much for that hydrogen. And it'll be moved on to the chemical of interest. And off goes the new form of the chemical. Now that enzyme's very happy because it, now it's done what it's meant to do. But it actually is doing that probably 5,000 times a second. It's a really big, uh, fast reaction. And then NAD itself gets recycled and made back into NADH. So it's a, it's a cycle. But what we discovered, um, well, some of us discovered, I was just one of them, is that NAD itself isn't just used for these chemical reactions. That was discovered over 100 years ago by some Germans. What it's actually also doing is that the body uses it as a measure of adversity. And when there's adversity, not enough energy, too much exercise or any exercise, really, hot, cold, it appears that NAD levels uh, will, uh, will increase in, as a result. And that is beneficial. That turns on the body's defenses. And so as we get older, we lose NAD. We don't make as much and we degrade it, in fact. And so a 20-year-old will have double the amounts of someone like me who's in their you know, mid thirties, maybe, uh, on a good day, biologically, um, I'm actually 52, but I, I probably have, if I didn't supplement with NMN, I would have half the levels of a 20 year old, which is bad because now the sirtuins, the defense enzymes, um, and repair enzymes, there's one called PARP, they don't work as well. And we we succumb to aging. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing that, that NAD does, and it protects. Uh, and stores the information to be young. And information is important for preserving our youth. And the way genes are turned on and off is lost over time. Genes get dysregulated. Uh, it's like a scratched compact disc, if you remember what a compact disc is. Um, and, and NAD levels, high NAD levels preserve that information uh, until we figure out a way to actually reset the system and get those scratches off. So that's NAD. But if, if to make NAD, you, the cell uses NMN, which is nicotinamide mononucleotide, which you can buy as a supplement. And then to make the cell makes NMN from NR. And the cell makes NR from vitamin B3. So you can take any one of those and raise NAD levels. But what we've discovered um, in people, in clinical trials, is that the closer you get to the NAD itself, the better the boost in NAD that you get. But you can't take NAD itself because it's a very big molecule and it doesn't get in through the membrane of the cells. So NMN does that. And what we will report, but I'll tell you live now, is that if you take, or if we give a gram to our subjects, human subjects, for 10 days, they will double their NAD levels in their blood cells. Um, and in fact, if you give two grams, you triple it. Now, so I take a gram a day to double my levels to get me back to being a 20 year old in the expectation and somewhat hope that uh, my body is now defending itself against aging. So, so that's I'm get, I, and I don't even want to look at my phone because I know I'm getting so many questions um, coming through about NAD because that's what's been popular lately. That's sort of been the trend. It's more accessible, mainstream. Uh, people are you know we get NAD IV drips, NAD injections. There's been NAD supplements that have been circulating for a long time. Are those not as effective um, for people to use as NMN? Uh, so the answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. Scientifically, uh, by the way, thank you for uh, turning me on to those. It was it was great to be turned on to NI, NAD trips. Okay. Yes, you're so welcome. <laughs> that was fun. But yeah. is is it does it help us the same? You know, do are it, people who have access it, to it? Well, it might. So we, we don't know if taking it every day as a supplement or having an IV of NAD is the same or one is better than the other. Uh, anecdotally, uh, they both seem to help certain conditions such as muscle aches, addiction, uh, NAD IV. There's a lot of evidence that that works, not proof, but evidence. Right. Um, and, but it, fertility. You know, fertility is definitely on that possible list and it was my collaborators and I show that in mice, you can reverse 
female infertility with NMN after just a month. So that was a remarkable finding. We don't know if that's true in women yet, but there are some some examples of it might ha- might be happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the answer there is so get, having a big spike in NAD in your body, it might kickstart the body. There, there's a, an effect in the body called pseudo hypoxia. And we discovered this happens when you get older, your muscles think that they're starved for oxygen, but they're not really. And we, I think that having a big bolus of NAD or hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is putting your body at greater uh, oxygen uh, and, and um, barometric pressure will kickstart the body and get you through that pseudo hypoxia. So that your body's not fooled into thinking you don't have enough. And when it does that, by the way, it shuts down the energy production in the body. So that's a way possibly to rejuvenate the muscles of your body and potentially your brain as well. Yes, I love hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, We've talked about it and uh, and I've shared about it. It's on my blog. For anyone who isn't familiar with it yet, you can go to the site and just search for it. And I have a blog with a lot of information on hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I got a chance to do that today, so really happy about it. Some really amazing results that I've had over the years with it. Um, there are a lot of questions about whether or not you can take too much NAD. Can your levels be too high in your body? There's no evidence of that yet. Uh, we've given mice a lot of NMN uh, for years, uh, for years in their life at high doses, haven't seen any negative effects. In the human clinical trials, we haven't gone more than two grams a day. Uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, but no negative side effects there. Uh, And looking at extensive blood biochemistry. um, Mm -hmm. So I don't know of any yet. Um, Like anything, you can always overdose in it. You can overdose on water. So you need to be very careful. And and if you're going to try supplement, don't take the full amount. In my view, it's better to ramp it up and check your blood and work with your doctor to make sure that you're not doing any damage to your body particularly the liver is susceptible to supplements. So mm-hmm. I monitor myself um, through a company that uh, I work with called Inside Tracker, but you can work with your doctor and just make sure that your body's healthy as you do something new like that. Um, but you know, if, if there was a problem with NMN, I would stop taking it. And I certainly would, would alert my family and friends as well, but I haven't seen anything yet. Mm-hmm. No, th- so thank you for that. Cause there are so many questions that have just come through. Can you take too much? Is it safe when you're pregnant? Uh, which are good questions. Uh, I don't know if you want to share some insight on that. Well, I, we gave it to, to pregnant mice and, and there was no negative effect. But I think, you know, I'm not a, a physician. I think you'd want to talk to your physician, um, obstetrics, gynecology uh, experts, so that uh, they weigh in. Because we really don't know. that We're talking about the cutting edge of science right now. And... Uh, when you're on the cutting edge, you always want to exercise caution. Yes, um, and that's true. And, and that's a good reminder that this is all information that Dr. Sinclair is kind and generous in sharing to everyone. But you always want to check with your practitioner, your doctor, your, um, your nutritionist, your functional medicine doctor about what you're putting into your body. And you always want to keep track of it with tests to make sure that it's something that's in alignment with you and that you are titrating the doses so um and and so okay so uh, thank you for that there's so many questions about there's, that. there's just but, a um, question about hypothyroidism that came up um yes uh so again tr- you can try it but do it with your doctor that a good friend of mine uh had hypothyroidism and and managed to get off the the, the hormones so again I, I think that it, it's possible just uh make sure that it's done with supervision Okay, good. Good reminder. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions about brands and, you know, recommendations that we have. Um, maybe this is a good time to share that we are going to, we've put together um, a document, we've put together some information that we'll share, we'll have on both our, of our links. Uh, and, and where else are you putting it? You're putting it on your link, right? In your bio and, and, and on different platforms. Uh, that will have Dr. Sinclair's recommendations of some trusted sources and partners that he has, um, some resources that uh, we'll, we've collaborated on and we've kind of collected to make it 
a little bit easier for you guys um, to access that information and also information on the replays for our live series. So just wanted to let you guys know that so it makes it a lot easier and you can sign up there and questions that aren't answered here might be answered there in those resources. Oh, there's, so. there's Gizmo. He's back. Gizmo is back. <laughs> Serena, there, there was a question about uh, little lipoprotein little a. Yes. I'll, I'll be brief. So this this is one of the major. You can be detailed. We love it. Do we have time? Yes, we do. Okay. So LP little a is is the strongest genetic cause of heart disease and cardiovascular disease in people. And about 20 to 30 percent of people have the really bad form of little uh, protein, lipoprotein little a, that makes a lot of it and very small particles. So why is small cholesterol particles? Why is that bad? Turns out that if they're small, they get into the into the lining of blood vessels more easily, and they also get oxidized. And oxidation is is like a type of aging. It makes hard arteries. And LP little a, the genes for that are the strongest for heart disease, as I mentioned. And you can check, you can have a genetic test. There are those commercial ones. Uh, 23andMe is the one that I used. And my doctor looked at it and he said, David, you have the bad form. You've got the one that's probably going to kill you uh, if you don't do something about it. And so that at that point, I became much stricter about my diet mm -hmm. um, and trying to get my cholesterol down, which is now fully under control. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. Thanks. Uh, and you and you recently were sort of playing with that a little bit. You shared on your social media uh, about whether or not you can control that a little bit more with your diet, um, or whether or not you needed to lean on, on medication. And it was a good indicator that sometimes we do need to lean on medication to help our bodies balance and regulate, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay talking about that. Uh, I I've been on a statin for since I was 30 because my family has super high cholesterol. My grandmother had a stroke at age 30. So I, I, I probably would be close to dead by now if I didn't do something about it. So I, I needed to turn to medicine, but it, even the medicine wasn't strong enough. It needed this diet. Uh, and I've been pretty healthy over my life, but my numbers, cholesterol and everything else, uh, which actually Serena, I, I've shared some of those with you, mm -hmm. they've never looked better. And I attribute that uh, mainly to the shift in the diet that I've made since we met. It's great. I mean, it's such, it's, it's always, it's always so rewarding to see results, right? Like when you make little, when you make shifts. Um, and so I'm, I'm always encouraging people to make shifts. They don't have to be super drastic, right? But just making a few shifts, adding some more plants, reducing a little bit of meat, reducing alcohol intake or removing it can really make shifts and it shows up in your blood work, which Dr. Sinclair is shared with us over the course of the last few months, um, which is amazing. Um, Whitney Cummings was just uh, saying some funny things as usual. Hey, Whitney, nice to see you here. <laughs> I don't see her comments, but I might have missed it. Thoughts on Stevia. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Stevia. Um, there's also, um, what is it, monk fruit that you like, Serena? Yeah, but I love monk fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I avoid chemical sweeteners uh, and I avoid sugar like like it's a plague, really. Uh, I rarely <laughs> eat dessert. I do steal it occasionally, mm -hmm. but I haven't eaten a full dessert with very few exceptions since I was 40. I gave up dessert and I, that's that reason. But stevia, I, I think it's fine. Serena, what do you think of stevia? Um, I like, I, I usually choose either stevia or monk fruit. I mean, they're both plant-based. And um, and so those are my sort of sugar substitutes. Depending on what the recipe is, sometimes I'll use coconut sugar, but that still has a, has a glycemic index that reflects regular sugar. So I do that on occasion, but stevia and monk fruit, I think are the two of the you know best choices if you still want the flavor and you still want that sweetness but you don't want to change the markers and you don't actually want the sugar so so, so you, you and i are big fans of chocolate right? we are mm -hmm. and so so when i am not eating uh let's say i skip lunch i'm i'm okay nibbling a little bit of chocolate in the afternoon and there are some stevia based chocolates and i also look for the high cocoa content above 80 percent preferably 90. Hundreds a bit too bitter for me, but that's a really healthy snack. Mm -hmm. um, there are chemicals in there that are 
extremely healthy. And I, I regard that as one of the healthiest foods you can get that's also really pleasurable. Yes, I do too. So full of meds. Sometimes when I have sometimes when I have clients who, you know, kind of feel guilty for having a little piece of chocolate after dinner, I mean, I'm like, maybe you are just a little deficient in magnesium and you just yeah. needed that little piece of chocolate mm -hmm. um, to supplement. So it is definitely one of my favorite uh, snacks. And, and the catechins are xenohermetic molecules. We know yes. that. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll activate a whole bunch of things, including down-regulating insulin signaling, which controls mTOR, mm -hmm. uh, and even looks like they control the genes that I work on, the sirtuins. So yeah, there are not that many things that are that feel good and they're really good for you. I think you can imagine the other ones I'm thinking of, but the chocolate is one of those great things to uh, indulge in. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yes, chocolate, and I think that, I think that, you know, well, obviously, I'm a chef and I'm a nutritionist, so I think that there's so many amazing foods that you can put together that are so nourishing and so good for you. And we ha we probably actually won't get a chance to dive fully into it um, this time. Um, but so many foods are actually longevity foods as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of things that you can indulge in, you just have to sort of choose wisely, which we will continue to go into over the course of our series. Um, but we, we still have so many questions well, here. We, we could try to answer them on the fly. Should we? There's there's yeah, so many about well, people are asking about resveratrol, which you you have to answer something about resveratrol since you're the person. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I take a gram of resveratrol. I, I open it up as a capsule, put it into my coconut-based yogurt every morning, or a little bit of olive oil, and that dissolves it. If you don't dissolve it, it's like eating cement. It it just won't go in. Uh, and so I do that every morning. And a man, it's it's soluble. You can just mix that with water or swallow it. That's fine. Um, I do mix some other polyphenols from plants as well. There's one called quercetin from apples and onions. There's one called physetin, which is from, I think, a, a type of flower. And those are also xenohermetic. And they have a couple of properties. One is they activate sirtuins, our favorite longevity enzymes that require NAD. And they have this new function that's been discovered called senolytic. And physetin looks very interesting. It extends the lifespan of mice. It kills senescent cells, these zombie cells that stop dividing in your body. There are clinical trials that are ongoing. And so I take uh, physetin occasionally to try and rid myself of those cells as well. But that's my morning uh, ritual with that uh, yogurt. Yeah, and you know, there is uh, several questions about what time of the day you recommend. And, you know, we're, I'm on the same protocol, you know, taking the same things as well. Uh, do you recommend people taking all of these supplements at the beginning of their day, middle of their day, end of the day, separating it out? Um, sometimes people need guidance on that, and it doesn't say on the bottle. No, it's funny it doesn't say it on the bottle. It's true. Mm -hmm. So I take the things that boost my energy in the morning, resveratrol, quercetin, physetin, NMN will boost energy. And the last thing I need at night, like a lot of us, are um, you know an energy boost. And so I do that in the morning. And then at nighttime, I take things that calm me down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, GABA, a little bit of melatonin, very little amount of melatonin, uh, my vitamin D, some fish oil, uh, and then my medicine, the Lipitor. Uh, okay. I shouldn't mention the brand, but atorvastatin. But yeah, in any case, uh, these boosters that rev up mitochondria and activate the sirtuins, those are those are for the morning. In fact, NAD levels will go up and down during the day, and in the morning you want it to peak, and you get a lot of energy, and then at nighttime it'll come down again. And if you start interfering with that circadian rhythm, as it's called, you'll have sleep problems as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's so that's something important to point out to people that the time of the day that you're taking and then um, boosting your energy levels may affect your sleep. So just to be mindful about that. Um, for those of you who are starting it or who are already on it and you're just sort of taking it whenever at the beginning of your day is probably better if you're going to be taking it at all. Uh, should we try to dive into some of the, can you see the question box or should I just read some of them off um, here? Let's see. Um, yeah, read some of gosh there's a lot of questions thanks there's everybody. so many questions you know people want to talk about right. fasting some people some people said um they want to know about fasting some people said you we thought you only eat dinner but sometimes you just eat breakfast um it's not it's not um sketched it's not you know written in stone but it's uh, a lifestyle a guide you know a protocol yeah. 
Mm -hmm. so most days I'll skip breakfast. Um, that yogurt, by the way, is just a tiny little bit. I don't regard that as breaking my fast. Um, that's, but I need that. Otherwise, these molecules probably won't work. Um, but then I, I won't eat after a little bit of yogurt until very late afternoon or dinner with the occasional nibble on a chocolate or a nut mm -hmm. um, to give me some extra oomph for some uh, vitamins or minerals. Selenium from Brazil nuts, for example, is important. Yeah, um, sure. But I, I think this is really important, Serena, is that we say... Uh, you don't have to be so dogmatic about a diet change. You know, I, I try my best and I most days I succeed. And if I don't, I'm not hard on myself. And and that's the way that you can maintain long-term success with any diet. Yep, absolutely. It's just sort of like creating that goal, having those rituals uh, and, and doing your best, especially if you're traveling a lot or... I mean, sometimes you just, you just can't do it. And so, and so knowing that that's shooting for that, you know, trying to do it four or five, six days a week. And if some days you don't, that's okay. That's what makes it sustainable. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. There are people that are asking about um, olive oil versus other oils. I think you recommend olive oil because of the polyphenols, but if it's about taking uh, these synolytics with a fat, does it really matter if it's, olive oil or something else it shouldn't matter mm -hmm. uh, you could mix it with some some greek yogurt or coconut yogurt just a, a little bit you know it's it's really a little bit and what what's important to me is it doesn't raise my blood sugar levels so i've, mm -hmm. I've worn one of these patches um that allows me to see these spikes and if you look at my blood glucose levels during my day it's totally steady whereas someone who has breakfast and lunch is doing this and they feel good and then they're hungry and they have this brain fog and then they go up again. So my liver is what makes most of my sugar during the morning. And that's what I, I care about mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, olive oil is, I think, the best oil because it also has high levels of oleic acid. And oleic acid has been shown to activate the sirtuins like NAD does and resveratrol does. Mm -hmm. um, and so I include olive oil. But in terms of dissolving those polyphenols, those senolytics and, and the resveratrol, uh, any oil should work as long as it doesn't those powders don't sink to the bottom of the liquid. You're mm -hmm. probably good to use that. Um, I've even tried, I like to mix up my diet like anybody else. I've tried olive oil plus a bit of vinegar and a basil leaf in the morning. It's like drinking, a, uh, what do you call it, salad dressing in the morning. Uh, that one lasted for about a month. I've given up on that. I now like this coconut yogurt that you've turned me on to actually. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, yeah, I think that as long as it's, it's not crunchy, you'll be fine. So yeah, because you had mentioned that it's like concrete, and there was a couple questions about that. Like, what does that mean? It becomes concrete. Is that the way your body processes it? The way it takes it in? Is it not um, bioavailable in that form? That's right. What you just said is the right term. It's not bioavailable because it comes in these crystals and these very crunchy little crystals. And in water, they'll just sink to the bottom. And in your gut, they'll just flow straight through. Mm -hmm. And we know this from dog and animal studies. And so you need to make it soluble and and resveratrol and these other molecules in plants are normally carried around in the plant because the plant puts sugar onto them and then they're soluble but when they get extracted by the manufacturers the sugar is taken off or they don't pull those ones out and you're left with this insoluble solid crunchy material that doesn't get into the body if you just eat it mm -hmm. without anything else right Okay, so you guys heard it here. That's why. That's why you've got to do it with oil or fat. It doesn't have to be olive oil for those of you that it hurts your tummy. You can use avocado oil or other kinds of oil, but you do need some sort of a fat, and that's what makes it helpful. Um, yogurt brands, we won't likely endorse yogurt brands here, but I would say um, if, it's, if it's not plant-based, then something that's organic and clean, lower ingredients, no sugar. And if it is plant-based, same thing you know, something that's low in ingredients, no sugar, um, would be the best thing to do. Uh, the other oh, thing that we have... Mm -hmm. Oh, can I interrupt? Uh, the, um, oh, yes. There was a, a question, somebody said they have GI issues with resveratrol. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a problem when, when man manufacturers pull out resveratrol from Polygonum cuspidatum, which is not weed, uh, usually from China. There's another molecule uh, that causes gastric problems that comes along with it. And so if you experience any gastric problems, switch manufacturer, look for a company that has what's called GMP, good manufacturing practices, and try to go with a company that is reputable and has been around for a number of years. And uh, 
So yeah, that can happen. It's called uh, emodin, I think, is, is the chemical that comes across with it. So yeah, just be aware that you're getting super pure supplements. That's part of the problem with the industry that it's not well regulated. And if there's any discomfort, yeah, switch brands. And that's even true for medicines. Yeah. Uh, in the case of metformin, my metformin was giving me discomfort. So I switched to a compound pharmacy, compound pharmacy that made it fresh for me. And it's been much better. Yeah, much, much better. Um, I think you'd mentioned in other talks before the color of the supplements. And so maybe that's a good reference point as well for people who are yeah. trying to determine whether or not they've received something that's good quality or not good quality. Sure. Um, so metformin, just in case somebody's wondering, is the drug that activates AMPK, the third protective mechanism in the body. And it's for diabetics, type 2 diabetics, but you can get it from a doctor if, if, uh, if you talk to them and are very nice to them. Um, the question, though, is more about, um, what was the question? Blanking, Serena. Ah, uh, it's all right. So we have well, a couple of things we'll touch upon. We will we'll definitely want to continue a couple questions about metformin and berberine. But since you were talking about GMP, um, the uh, color. labeling on supplements, uh, and then I think uh, just I reference that you'd mentioned the color of supplements sometimes and um, yeah. what color they should be. So something that people can be aware of when they receive. Their, so where's where, where's where troll? is often contaminated even if it looks pure so it should be light gray and powdery uh, or white but even still it can be contaminated um, the worst ones are the ones that come out brown that resveratrol chemical chemically is not brown and that's true also for other supplements um, i try to look for them that are the color that they should be so for instance if, if you go to google or some other search engine and you type in a chemical let's say physetin okay this is the chemical i mentioned earlier that kills zombie cells mm -hmm. it'll tell you what color it should be it might say yellow or bright orange yeah it does uh -huh. so you should know that because yeah. if the capsule comes and it's filled with brown gunk throw it away <laughs> so do your homework you guys it's not just what dr sinclair said it's also what google says so do your homework it yeah. tells you what the color is um, and nman and nad are should be pure white mm -hmm. uh, and nr and nr so those are all white resveratrol should be sort of a light gray um oh there's another white. thing mm -hmm. i often asked how should people store these molecules oh yes super important the so resveratrol i've kept for 10 years at room temperature, but it has to be kept in the dark. Um, for a week, it'll be fine, but no longer than that. So I store things in my basement, actually. Um, but it can be kept at room temperature. NMN and NR, you want to keep them cold. So for, if you want to store them for over a few months, put them in the freezer, make sure they don't ever get wet. That's true for all chemicals um, and supplements. Uh, and so cold is good, freezer long term and fridge for short term. Um, occasionally I travel with NMN in my briefcase a few days or even a week's not going to hurt it too much. But the problem is if you leave it for longer, it can degrade and release nicotinamide or niacinamide, which can actually counteract the benefits of NAD if it becomes too high in concentration. Mm. What's too high in concentration? Because some people do take niacinamide. Um, and would you recommend that they don't? if they're taking NMN and NAD already? Oh, let's see. So in the skin, it, it seems to really help, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, really high doses. I, I would be reticent, and myself, I wouldn't take more than a few hundred milligrams of niacin or nicotinamide. Um, I prefer to take nicotinic acid, but it can, can cause flushing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we discovered in 2002, actually, that nicotinamide inhibits the sirtuins at a concentration of 50 micromolar, which means you probably have to take a gram of it to get to those concentrations or more. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're taking somewhere around 100 milligrams or even 200, I think, this is my guess, is, is it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, but because I'm taking these molecules, I think for the rest of my life, you know, I just don't want to take any risks like that. Right. Yeah, that was a good note. Um, and thank you for that. That was helpful for me as well. Um, okay, so we only have a few minutes left, and we have thousands of questions, and we didn't get a chance to dive into metformin um, very much, except for the fact that you, you know, switched to 
a compounded form um, and that it can hurt your tummy a, a little bit. Uh, there's people with questions about metformin and berberine. Um, and, and I, you know, and, and I, and I know that I'm asking questions that I already know the answers to, but it's so, it's helpful and so much better coming from you. Uh, if you could share about that and whether or not it's okay for people to take both, if you'd recommend that. And obviously mm -hmm. some people don't have access to metformin, right. especially without a prescription. And so berberine would be their best option. Correct. So if you're watching this from overseas, um, non-Western, non-English speaking country, you might be able to get metformin over the counter. But in the US, where most of us, I think, are located, you do need, do need a doctor. And if you cannot get a prescription, there are two options. One is there's a website I've seen that you, you could try to find. Um, it should be out there. You can uh, talk to one of their doctors and perhaps get a prescription in the US. But also what you can do is, so berberine is a, a plant-based uh, molecule from the berb plant. Uh, I believe it's from India by recollection. In any case, you can buy it. It should be bright yellow. Um, and it's been shown in my lab and others in animals to greatly protect against type 2 diabetes and works similar, similarly to resveratrol. Mm -hmm. And it's been shown in, in many clinical trials now, if you take a gram, um, and in many cases, two grams, which is a lot, uh, it will help treat type 2 diabetes. Now, we don't know if it'll extend lifespan, but it does seem to do the same kind of things that metformin does. And metformin seems to have all the hallmarks of a lifespan extending drug. So I think... Berberine is a, it's a good option. I used to take berberine before I had metformin, and I was taking a gram every morning. But again, it's also insoluble. So think about the yogurt and the oil options as well. And what about taking both? Um, just both? because I had several yeah. questions about it. That's, a, that's great. I, I was just reading a paper yesterday about this, that it can be additive, meaning that it can be beneficial to take both. And again, you do that under your doctor's supervision, of course, because it's actually quite a strong combination, mm -hmm. but it can help if metformin isn't sufficient or berberin on its own is not sufficient to bring down your blood sugar levels mm -hmm. or improve your overall metabolism, then the combination can actually work even better. Okay, great. Um... Okay, we're pretty much at the top of the hour. I just want to say really quick before um, making some announcements to thank you so much for spending the time with us. And I hope you had fun. This is really fun for me. I hope it was fun for the 1,700 people that were on here and stayed with us for an hour. Um, you guys are amazing. For everyone that sent in questions that we didn't get a chance to get to. If you want, you can go to the link in our bios um, and there's an opportunity to sign up and there's an opportunity to connect that way and save your questions for next time. Um, you can also send them through uh, either the text the text number or through, I guess, direct messages, but that's, that's a little challenging, I think, for, for David these days, you probably get thousands. Um, so maybe through the text messages and we'll try and get to them. And uh, for those of you asking, this is a dog, not a cat. His name is Gizmo, <laughs> and he's a Pomeranian. <laughs> and, and he is alive. I saw he him is alive. <laughs> he's just having a nap. Um, okay, so that's what I want to share. Is there anything that you wanted to share, David, before, before we jumped off? And really, this was, I'm so grateful. This was really amazing with so much information and we're definitely going to get this all cleaned up and have a replay up and, uh, and have captions and summaries. So that's really helpful for people. Yeah. Well, overall, I think a lot of people want to figure out what supplements to take and which brands. And as a professor, I'm, I'm not allowed to recommend brands, but I can tell you what to look for. And that is uh, companies that have been around a long time, companies that are local uh, and companies that certify their products, give quality control. And you want to look for ones that are at least 98% pure, preferably higher. And again, look for those letters GMP, good manufacturing practices. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will help guarantee that you get the right product. Um, yeah, that's the big one. Other than that, I think this is an exciting beginning to a series that you and I are going to put out and we'll 
continue to answer questions that come in. Yes. I know there's a lot of questions. There is, and you know, we didn't even get to all the points that we said that we would. Um, I probably talked too much, so I apologize for that, you guys. But um, but yes, we have, we still have to talk about longevity food fads and so many other things. So stay tuned. Maybe we'll extend this to more than just eight in our series. Um, but continue to send in your questions. And thank you so much, David. This was awesome. I'm super excited about this. And thank you guys so much for all your support and all the amazing comments. And uh, keep on sending your questions into us. Send them in via text. Go to the link in our bios. Sign up there. And we will keep you posted on the next one. Oh, did you want to tease about your, your next podcast coming out? Or do you want people to just stay, be mysterious? Um, I don't remember what the next one is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you guys just have to tune in on next Wednesday, and then we will we will see you guys after that. I, I do want to say thanks to everybody who listened, putting up with my voice for uh, about an hour. But uh, thank you for all the positive feedback. It's got five stars on Apple. It's one of the top podcasts in the world now. So it's been wonderful, the response. And I just appreciate everybody who's really busy to take time out of their day to listen. And I, I, my promise to you is to keep providing real science facts. If I say it, it's been researched by my team. And uh, that's my promise to you to be a real science educator and a source of trusted information. And you are. And that's Lifespan, you guys, his podcast and his book. We'll promote it more a little bit more next time. But thank you guys so much. We will see you next time. Thank you.